Christ. We're going to have an amazing worship service this morning. I just want to welcome everybody. I want to encourage you to sing and praise and worship this morning, whether that just be clapping along, whether that means that you're singing out loud, do what your heart feels, show your gratitude to Jesus today. Can I have you guys go in and stand up? I'm going to pray and lead you guys into a praise and worship, and I'm going to let you have it. I'm looking forward to hearing those amazing voices. Lord God, I just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us the space to come together and give you, give you some praise and worship, God. We need to realize that we can praise you anywhere because we just need to realize just the power that's in your name. And we should always have the gratitude and be present in the moment so that we can enjoy being together and enjoy praising his name together and lifting his name up. So as we praise this morning, Lord God, I pray that you hear us. I know that you do. And I just pray that in this moment that we really let it soak into our hearts. So please feel Welcome to clap along and sing. All right, y'all, let's give it up for Destiny. Destiny does an awesome job helping us get our info. All right, we're gonna get y'all to clap with us this morning and sing along. There we go. Come on. Dance in the darkness, sing through the fire. Praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta stay. The giant worship from the lion's den. Come on, church. Sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give me praise, give me praise. In the highest praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest. seat for a second. Uh, today we're going to do something a little bit out of the normal. We do it a couple times a year. Um, and it's a chance for some families to say something just by their presence that I think is really important. There's a few things we do that are like that. One of those is baptism. If you don't know, baptism is a, um, is a chance for people to say, 
I want to play the role of the man that was dead, buried, and resurrected for the rest of my life. And that's such an amazing thing. We get to do it through communion when we say for 2,000 years the church has been celebrating the fact that Jesus' death and resurrection is not just a story, but it's something tangible that we can feel and touch and taste and that changes our lives. And so this meal is a reminder of that. And so today is sort of like one of those things. Uh, we're going to have some families that want to stand in front of you as um, a sign that they want their children to follow Jesus all through their lives. And so those families, we, I think we have four this service. If y'all don't mind coming to the front now as we uh, set this up a little bit. Um, and the idea is this, is that, you know, as parents, parenting is really, really hard. I think everybody that's been through that would say they agree. It's unbelievably difficult. And what we're really saying is this as parents, is that as much as we want our children to love us, we actually want them to love Jesus even more because God knew them before we knew them. And as much as we love them, God actually loves them more. I mean, these parents, can you imagine the love they have for their children and the love you have for your kids if you have them? Um, but God actually loves these children more than these parents do, which is an amazing thought. And he's the father to the fatherless and that he calls children to himself. And uh, it's just such an amazing thought that God, God is passionately in love with these children and has good plans for them and wants the best for them. And so what these parents are saying by being in front of you is that that's what they want. Um, they want their children to follow him. And maybe even when they're adults, one day look back and not even remember a time when they weren't doing that, when they weren't following Jesus. Also today, what we're going to do, in addition to that and them saying that in here, I'll just read their names in a second. Um, we're as a church recommitting that we're gonna do our best to partner with them in that project, that we're gonna do whatever it takes that, was, that is within our capability. Some of you don't know why we're at the YMCA. There are a few better venues in town to do a service than the gym here. Um, but you know, we looked at all those venues that would be better for us and they were gonna be worse for the children. And so when it came down to the time to make a decision about where we needed to go, we said, we're going to prioritize the kids and the families with children over prioritizing me and my experience in a room. And so we want as a church for that, we don't want that to be the last time we do that. We want as we move forward, that's our ethic, man. That's what we want to do. We love to create a place that you love to come and that, that your friends love to come. And we're going to put a ton of work into that. If you can't tell, we put a lot of work into that now, but we want to keep doing that. But if we got to decide, we're going to prioritize your children and the next generation over me. And so that's a sign of, of what our church is really committed to. And so we, guys, if you're here, I know we got two services and not everybody's here every Sunday, but listen, I'm asking you, if you're a part of our church family, will you help us be all in on that? I don't know what that means for you. Maybe it's just in your prayer life or, or maybe it means putting up with inconveniences because we're a church that prioritizes kids. Um, and so I want to read their names and families, if y'all don't mind, just sort of waving, because um, we want you to pray for these families in a second, and maybe you can pick a family to really go all in and pray for. Um, so we've got Joella and Junette Whitcop. Yeah, waving, okay, they go, they're good. She didn't like that. You don't have to wave if you don't want to. <laughs> you do you. Uh, we've got uh, Leighton Gaddy. We've got Zoe and Scarlett Vincent. And we've got Bank Shearer. And so these parents, you know, whenever the angel came to Mary, I didn't say this in the first service, but I just thought about it. Whenever the angel came to Mary, what he basically said is, I'm going to bless you with this child, but then your responsibility, and the parents, this is for all of us, your responsibility is you're not going to be able to hold on to this child. And your responsibility is to give this child to the Lord, whatever that means. Because as crazy as it sounds, that's the greatest thing you can do for them. It's the greatest thing you can do for them. And so we're going to pray for these families. We're going to pray for these kids. Guys, church, here's what I want you to think, is that these kids are going to have some big forks in their lives, right? Some big decisions. And so maybe 14 years from now, I mean, it's just be one of those moments that's life-changing. And, you know, sometimes you never know it when you make the right decision. We can go ahead and be praying over that moment right now, can't we? Because our prayers don't have expiration dates. We could be praying over, can you imagine that, you know, a 16 year old or a 17 year old or they're, or they're 24 and they got that huge decision that's gonna be life changing. And isn't it amazing that we can be people that are praying over them now and we're praying for those moments ahead of time and that we're praying for these parents to be strengthened, right? And you know, the greatest thing that these kids could possibly have are parents that love Jesus. 
It's the greatest gift they could possibly have. That they'll grow in their faith, and they'll continue to walk in that, and that the Lord will bless them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask all of y'all to stand up, if you don't mind, and I'm going to ask these families to spread out, if that's okay. They'll go down the aisleways. And I'm going to ask you to pray for the family that's closest to you. Um, some of you may know their names, and you may not know who they are, but you can pray over them, right? Because, you're, listen, your prayer does not have an expiration date. And your prayer in some ways, I don't understand this, but will be in effect 10 years from now and 20 years from now. Now, some of y'all, as we pray, if you want to, this is fine, you may want to step out of your seat and put a hand on a parent's shoulder, right? Because parenting's hard, and you want to pray for that parent, and you want to pray for that family, you can do that. I'll lead us in prayer, and then I want to give our church just a second to pray for these families, whether it's silently or out loud, to ask God to bless them, and to bless their futures, and just that He would do amazing things in their lives. Father. I pray for each of these children, that you would bless them, that you would help them to love you, Father, that you would go ahead and give them soft hearts, Father, for you and the things that you care about, that you would help them to be all that you've made them to be. Father, I pray that you bless them, that you would deal gently with them, Father, when it comes to the forks in the road in life, that you would help them to make wise decisions, that you would be there to walk alongside them and help us to be a church that supports them. We ask that all in the name of our Savior. Now, church. I'm going to ask you to pray for these families, either from your seat or to step out and put a hand on their shoulder. You can pray that these children will come to know Jesus as their Savior at a young age. Pray for these parents that they'll grow more and more like Jesus in their character. We can pray over the moments in these children's futures right now that God would bless them and protect them. We ask these things in the name of the one that defeated death and sin on the cross and then walk out of the tomb to prove it so that we can confidently move forward and we can even offer the most precious gift you've given us, our children to you, knowing that you're trustworthy and that you're good, Father. We pray for their blessing. pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, y'all can stay standing. And these families, thank y'all so much for letting us be a part of this. Well, y'all, it's an honor to get to be here this morning, to get to pray for and with these families. and. We're going to sing a song um, that we just introduced at church not long ago, but it's called Sunday's Coming. And I love that song for this morning because we can't, like, I have a child, and I know all the things I want for my child. Like, I know all the dreams that I have, all the things that I want for her and Jesus, but I can't see them right now, but I can trust Him that even if the plan isn't the way I think it should look, like he's gonna provide, he's gonna be there. And he's been the model for that hope and for that heart for our children, for our family since the moment that he woke out of that grave. So this morning as we sing Sunday's Coming, this is a song about like the hope that we have in Jesus because of what he did, like our salvation. But it's also a song about the hope that we can have in him for our children, for our families, for our spouses, for the things we haven't seen unfold yet. So. As we sing this this morning, I just want to encourage you, like, let this be something that that hits your heart. Let him, let him speak to you about what he wants to do in your family's life, what he wants to do in your life. And let's trust him that even when we can't see that plan, even when we don't understand it, that he really does have a plan for us. He really does work all things together for our good and his glory. So we're going to sing that this morning. Y'all sing out. Let's worship. Only 
Cause you're 
just pray this morning. Lord God, I just want to thank you for allowing us the space to come together, for us to lift up your name, Lord God, and to remember just the power of your name, Lord God. Your, your name is almighty and so powerful in the darkest of times, in the darkest of trials and tribulations, Lord God. Your name is just enough to change it. So as we sing, as we just sang, Lord God, we speak your name of Jesus over all the darkness in our lives, Lord God. And I just want to pray that as this church service goes on this morning, that our hearts and our minds are open to the new, to the word today. And I pray that, that God gives Jimmy the words so that he can be a vessel and to God speak through him to, to give our hearts a message that we need today, Lord God, something that we can apply to our everyday lives, Lord God, so we can be the most awesome human that we can be. Lord God, I just want to pray that we are present in this moment, that we leave all the struggles and the worries and the anxiety and everything outside of these walls and that we take this time to really be present and to soak in your word and your greatness and, to your gra and just give gratitude to your name and remember just how powerful it is. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. You may take your seats. So we're switching things up a little bit this morning. I'm gonna give a little bit of announcements. Um, so, yes, I'm Destiny for those who don't know. Hello, hello. Um, so if you're new or newish here, please go to the Connect tent. It's a tent that's in the lobby. This is really one of the only times where there's a camper's tent in a lobby. So if you have any questions or if you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We'd love to speak with you and get to know your name and get you plugged in and so that you can receive the messages and updates that come th out through text. So if you're not signed up to get those messages that come out each week, please feel free to stop by the Connect tent. I will be there and I'd be glad to get you signed up for that because I love getting those messages throughout the week to give me a little bit of encouragement. Um, so if you haven't, please stop by the Connect tent. Like I said, I'll be there and I'd love to get to know you, love to put a name with the face because I see a lot of names but don't know a lot of, I mean, I see a lot of faces but don't know a lot of names. So I would love to get to know you, so I will be there. Also, if you like to sign up for softball or baseball, the signups for that are still going. So if there's anything inside of you that wants to do that, please stop by and sign up for that. Also, we have graduations coming up. We want to recognize those wins. So if you have a kindergartner, a high schooler, or even a college graduate, please stop by the Connect tent and get them signed up for that so that we can recognize that win. Because there's a lot of trials and tribulations that go on. But when we have something to celebrate about, we need to celebrate it. So if you have any kids or young adults that we can celebrate for graduating, please let us know about that so we can celebrate them. That is awesome. Um, I believe that's all I got to say this morning. Yeah? Okay. So I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your service. Um, just remember to be present and just open your, your ears and your heart and let Jesus speak to you. Good morning. So listen, if you're here on a rainy day, I figured you're probably going to like bring some energy. So I need your help with a little audience participation. If I say something that you really are a fan of, you can applaud, okay? So just so you hear me out, you know, let's practice this, okay? Let's do something, something really easy. Uh, how about who's a fan of going to the beach? Is almost summertime. Any fan? Okay, okay. All right, let's, okay, now we're going to go rapid fire. You ready for this? I didn't do this the first service. I'm just making this up on the fly. I think it would be better when we do the first service. Okay, you ready? Uh, cheeseburgers. Who's our cheeseburger people? Let's go. Um, let's go. Uh, pizza. Any pizza people? All right. How about anybody like to binge watch on Netflix? Okay, how about Fractions? Oh, okay, so Fractions, that's the, that's the thing. Who's our Fractions person? Anybody? Who was that? Way to go. Larry, that's a lie. That's a lie. I, t I knew him in high school. <laughs> so, yeah, Fractions, usually people are Fractions. I was a math teacher. Let me tell you a secret. I was a math teacher. I hate Fractions too, okay? <laughs> I hate Fractions too. I, I enjoyed the math when it got around to the letters and stuff, and you couldn't really mess up with addition or subtraction. I was a big fan of that. Okay, I got a Fraction for you I want you to think about today. Uh, it's the number one-third, the fraction one-third. Don't, don't stress out. That'll be it for the day. You don't have to convert it to a decimal or a percentage unless you just want to show off, you know. Then you can do it. Um, but one-third. Here's what, here's what I want you to hear me on, okay? From the day you're born to the day you die, I'm sorry, okay, um, you spend one-third of your life at 
Where? Work, work or school. Way to go, Canaria. You're ahead of the game. Middle school students these days, they know what they're doing. Okay, um, so yeah, so one third of your life at work or school, you know what I mean, those, those kind of things. For most people, everybody's you know, life situation is different, but just in general, a third of your life. So here's a thought for those of you that are Jesus people and you're really serious about that. This series is all about this. It's all about the idea that, um, man, Jesus has saved us so that we can go to heaven when we die and we can look forward to the future. But that's not all. He saved us so that we can be redeemed people now and we can act like it and we can live like it. And so that definitely includes the third of your life that is at work. And in our culture, in our Christian culture, what we've done is we sort of divorced or separated things into categories. And so we have some things that fall into the category of like spiritual things. And we have some things that fall into the category of not spiritual things like work. And if you are a follower of Jesus and you have not included the one third of your life that you spend at work, that means you're really only given two thirds of your life at the best. You're probably not doing that to Jesus. And it means you're robbing God of one third of your life. And that will never end, out well, end up well. That won't go well for you. That won't go well for your family. That won't go well for the world around us. And maybe it's just possible that if some of us, me included, if some of us have been feeling like something in our life is a little bit off and we're missing out on some meaning and some purpose, we're just something's not quite right and we can't tell what it is, maybe it's been we've been thinking of work or the one third of our life, lives as it not falling under the umbrella of our faith in the same way that we think of other things. Now, let me back up a little bit here. In the book of Genesis, we get this picture of humanity that is really, really cool because one of the first things we're told is that God commanded the man, Adam, and it doesn't mean just the man, it's humanity, to tend this garden which is a beautiful picture of what we're meant to do with our life. There's this thing that we're given, and we're all given so much by the generations that have come before us. This thing that we've been given that's already sort of cultivated, and you know, it's already sort of neat, and it's, all, it's got paths, and it's got flower beds, but weeds keep popping up, and it's our job to cultivate that, to grow that garden, to like tend that garden. But then, along the way, something went really sideways with humanity, and we've all experienced that. You don't have to be a Christian to believe that. There's just something that's sort of twisted. And so what happens is things that were really good, things that were meant for, to be really excellent in our lives have gotten twisted, and now, man, they're just they're complicated, and they're not what they should be. It's like money. Money's a good thing. Money's not a, a bad thing. But y'all know the love of money gets twisted and it gets complicated and it causes all kind of heartache in our lives. And it's a money. Listen, here's what money is. You know what money is? It's somebody saying what you did is of enough value that I need, there needs to be some exchange to show how valuable what you did for me was. That's what you do when you buy a cheeseburger at McDonald's, okay? Maybe it's a good choice, maybe not, okay? But what, that's what you're saying is there's enough value in this thing and there's enough value in work. It's, it's true of um, sex, that God created sex, but man, it's complicated now, right? It's complicated and we get twisted and we have all kinds of problems, but it's also true of work. That work is something that was part of God's original plan for humanity, but many of us today would say we're in work situations that are not good, and that's not your fault. Or we're in situations where work is just labor. And it's meant to be so much more than that. So if you're a serious follower of Jesus and you want it to apply to every area of your life, let's spend, we've got 20 minutes, okay? We're going to go on this thing. And let's see if we can pull some gems out of this. Wouldn't it, okay. For those of you that have let Jesus in to the way you spend your money, I'm going to guess that every single one of you would say you're better off in terms of your relationship with your money because of it. I would, I would guess that every single one of you that have gotten really serious about letting God into your marriage or your relationships would say, my marriage or my closest relationships are better off because of that, right? I, I'm just, I, I'm, I hear stories, okay? I'm ne really, I don't hear dissat I will hear dissatisfied customer stories for people that have gone all in on church. Because, you know, sometimes church can become an idol but people that go all in on Jesus in their marriage, I've never heard of that not really being just an amazing thing. And so here's what I want you to think. I believe that if you'll go all in and let Jesus all in in your work area of your life, a third of your life, that you will be so happy you did that. 
It will make your life so much better. In fact, it will move you closer and closer to being the awesome human that God really wants you to be. In fact, that Jesus died on a cross so that you could begin being now as a part of, as a part of new humanity who shows off what the future is meant to look like. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to the book of Colossians chapter 3. Um, Paul writes this um, to some early followers of Jesus in a town called Colossae. It was a very complicated town, um, lots of different races and lots of different religions, and there's a lot of these are people with Jewish backgrounds, but some are not. And so here's what he writes in Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Richly is such a key word. Now, if you, this is one of those books in the Bible that you could actually read the whole book pretty quickly. Uh, I read it last night. It doesn't take long at all. It's almost like the perfect sweet spot, 10 minutes, okay? And you'll have read the whole book of Colossians. And if you read it, here's the, here's the thing about the book of Colossians. It is just what this series is about. Paul is saying Jesus died on the cross for you so that you could be heirs to this amazing thing called the kingdom of God, freedom from, uh, from sin and addiction, forgiveness of what's in your past, an amazing future. So let's live like it. Come on. Like, let's do it. And the word he uses there richly, and here's what you think of it, is that um, if you live your life in alignment with the teachings of Jesus, Paul is saying, whether you believe him or not, that the best way to describe what your life will become is rich. Some of y'all been broke. How many of y'all been broke before? Anybody been broke? I've been broke. Okay, I've been broke. Okay, I was so broke, I, I quit drinking soft drinks because I realized uh, that water was free, okay? And that's not a joke. That's not like a your mama joke. That's not like a, I'm so broke that, like seriously, I was so broke, I quit. I, I realized water's basically free. And so I started drinking water, quit soft drinks. Hadn't started back yet. I could today, you never know. Okay, um, anyway, so, so I've been like broke. Some of us have been broke. And, and you know, so the idea is this, is that when you don't follow this way of teaching, no matter how much you look like you got it together, it's almost going to be like your life is broke. But really what God wants for you is He wants you to live a rich life. That's so opposite of the way many of us grew up thinking about Christianity, isn't it? We grew up thinking that to be a Christian is to, is to like be, have no fun and have no purpose, have no meaning and not do, not do things that don't, you know. But really it's like the idea this is rich. Another way, not just financially rich, analogy. You can think of it like dessert rich. You know, that's a ri like rich cake. It's like full of flavor and all the things that the cake is supposed to be. That's what your life is supposed to be. And so Paul says, listen, you want to live a rich life. You don't want to be broke. Like you don't want to walk around your spirit broke. You don't want to walk around like your marriage is broke, like you got nothing in the bank account. You don't want to wa walk around like broke when it turn, uh, comes to your purpose and your meaning in life and doing things that are important and that you can feel good about after you've done them. You want to be rich in those categories, rich in every way. So let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. That's part of what we're doing here today is that, man, sometimes those songs like punch me in the gut. I, I, I hope that happens to you sometimes. It's like, man, you know, you would think it would be easier for somebody who prepares to speak to you most Sundays to get, like, to, to be more aware of how amazing Jesus' sacrifice for us was and how it is the greatest hope for our families and for our children. I mean, you would think that would be front of mind for me, but you know what I'm doing while I'm sitting backstage is we speak Jesus. I mean, I know we repeated that a few times, but like the 10th time in, it finally hit me. I was like, oh my goodness, that is what our families need. Like that is what our schools need. I'm not saying we go into school preaching, I'm not saying, but they need, they need Jesus people, you know? That is what we need. And so he says, this is one of the things we're called to do is to get together, and uh, admonishing means this. It means, it means to be reminded sometimes of what you already know, but in a fresh way. It means for somebody, maybe like me, and somebody that stands on the stage is no better than anybody else, is no more important than anybody else. I don't have some kind of spiritual cape I keep tucked in my shirt. You know, just the same as everybody else, possibly with the gift of teaching, to stand on the stage and say to followers of Jesus, when it comes to being the awesome humans you're meant to be, you can do it. Like, come on, you can do it. Don't hold out a third of your life or don't hold out a fifth of your life or don't hold out even a percent of your life. You can do it. Well, you know, you can do it. So he says, this is important that, that we get that, you know, because we need to, each of us needs to keep growing. And, like, I need to be pushed. I don't know about you. I know I need to be pushed in life. I don't need to stay where I'm at. 
I'm staying where I'm at is really going backwards. I need to be stretched and pulled, and that's what God does to us sometimes when we get together. Okay, admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, not, not a third of what you do, not two-thirds of what you do, not four-fifths of what you do. More fractions. Sorry, I told you no more fractions. We'll go percents. Not 80% of what you do, not 70, you know, 100% of what you do. Whatever you do, Paul says, whether in word or deed, in other words, in, in what you say, but also in what you do, do it all in the name of Lord, the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him, which means... When you do good work, you give glory to God. Not just when you say good words, right? Not just when you say good words, not just when you sing good words, but when you do good, good work, I'm talking about good work, whatever kind of work you do, you give glory to God according to Paul because whatever you do, you can do that. It reframes everything in our lives. Now there are no longer like the important things and the spiritual things, and now there's the mundane things that I've got to do. Everything falls under the umbrella of cosmically important because you are a redeemed image bearer. Doesn't mean it's all easy to get there, but it means it's all important. Now, verse 18, this is a controversial verse. I thought about skipping it, not because I don't want to teach it, just because it takes time, but we'll do it anyway. Okay, wives, submit yourselves to your husband as, in, as is fitting in the Lord. Now, don't, don't, don't leave. Give me, give me 30 seconds, okay? Give me 30 seconds before you bail on me. All right. Um, here, here's, here's the, here, let me tell you what that doesn't, does not mean clearly, and then I'll, I'll tell you what I think he's getting at here. It does not mean, wives, you are less important than your husbands. You are some, women are somehow inferior, second-rate human beings. Do you know who believed that 2,000 years ago when this was written? The Roman Empire. The, the, the ruling religious leaders believe that. The Christian movement elevated women to the same status as men in importance and in value. Do you know who the first people ever were to say that Jesus is risen? Who were they? Anybody know? I'll give you a multiple choice, men or women? Women. Um, do you, okay, do you know the most theologically rich book in the whole Bible probably is the book of Romans? Some of y'all have heard of that. Anybody, this, is, this is not as easy. Does anybody know, uh, Paul wrote it. Does anybody know who Paul got to deliver the letter to the Romans to the Christians in Rome? A woman named Phoebe. Now, in their culture, whenever you delivered a letter, and I'm not getting into any controversial topics. I'm just stating facts here. These are facts. In their culture, whenever you delivered a letter, did you know most likely the first person to ever read the book of Romans was a woman named Phoebe? And did you know whenever the person who delivered the message would read the, read the letter, do you know what you would normally do? You would have questions about the letter. Because that book of Romans is complicated. <laughs> that stuff is crazy, okay? You can't even read two sentences without your mind exploding. Uh, Paul literally... Literally, people have done an IQ test on Paul, like in reverse, Look, and he's a genius, no matter what you think about him, okay? He's a genius. And you know who they would ask questions to about the book of Romans? They would ask it from the person that brought the letter. It was what they did in their culture. So the first person to ever break down the book of Romans was a woman named Phoebe. In fact, here's what it looks like. We see reading between the lines. It looks like in the first century, women were elevated so fast that in some cases, women, this applies to men equally, but women began to think that their commitments to their family and their marriage maybe were less important than the, God, the calling that God had put on their lives. And so we'll read between the lines that maybe some women began to like neglect their families and their children and their marriage. This could be equally said to men. In fact, women were elevated so quickly, Paul's saying, don't forget if you've made a commitment through marriage or have had children, which is a commitment, whether you agree to it or not, you got it, okay? <laughs> that it's a commitment that actually your first ministry is to your family. That's true for men too. In fact, you know, sometimes you hear from churches, like you get the sense that like your first ministry to the church, that's wrong. You know, and I love you attending services, but if you ever got something really important going on in your family on a Sunday morning, and you can't, and it's important, okay, I'm saying it's important for your children to know you come to church. I really think that's important, okay? But if it's something really important, here's the pastor telling you something. I don't want to see you because your first ministry is to your family. You know, and it, so, okay, so he's saying sometimes 
We have to sacrifice our wants and desires and wishes because we're in this relationship. Paul, I'm going to stuck here way too long. I knew if we had this verse, it would take forever. It did last service too. I can't help it. Because I did, okay, we need to keep, um, you know, in the first century before the Jesus movement got started, did you know that men could pretty much divorce their wives for any reason, good or bad, and that women couldn't get a divorce, you were pretty much stuck. And so what Jesus came along is he said, you have heard it said, <laughs> you know, basically you can get a divorce anytime you want. And then Jesus did something that would tick the men off. He says, that is no longer how it's going to work for people that are in me. That's not how it's going to work. The divorce is never a win, but people are complicated, right? So there's a, we get this, this vision between what Jesus taught and what Paul spoke is that, you know, for example, I don't want to go too deep, but for example, he would say that wives, if, you're, if you are, have an abusive husband who is cheating on you, you are not being disobedient if you seek a divorce. So it means that if you're getting beat by your husband, Paul is not saying sit there and take it like a good girl. That's not, that's not what he's saying. He's saying sometimes, sometimes we have to submit our dreams and our hopes sometimes to the commitments that we've made. And I know it's complicated. You don't have to take my word for it. You can do research. Husbands, verse 19, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now that's easy for us, but 2,000 years ago, it was like, really, Paul? <laughs> like, you are no fun. Like, come on, just ridiculous. You tell me, I can't, you telling me, I can't leave my wife and get a new model. That's not Jimmy speaking. I'm just pretend, first century guy. Okay, I can't leave my wife and get a new model, and I can't, like, Give her a good beating every once in a while? And Paul's like, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. That's the Roman way. That's the Jewish way. In the Jesus way, that is out of bounds. Now, some of you, I'm bringing this up, and I know it's a sensitive topic because you've gone through this, and so I'm trying to make it a little lighthearted. But, but you know, the reason the expectation in our culture, even among non-Christians, is that it's wrong for men to abuse women comes from the Jesus movement. That's not always the way it's been. It's the way it is now, and we take it for granted 2,000 years into this thing. Okay, next verse. It gets harder in a second, <laughs> not easier. Children, obey your parents. This is a good one. Let's, let's, I should have preached the whole message on this. It would have been easy. Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Um, verse 21, fathers, men get two of these commandments, okay? Uh, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. 2,000 years ago, the normal way things worked in, in, in non-Christian culture was men were pretty much ruthless taskmasters who viewed their children as um, mouths to feed until they were old enough to do work as almost slaves to the family, literally, okay? You, again, you do your research and check that out. All right, verse 22, we're going to get, this is it. You ready? This is the cell phone. He says, slaves, this is Paul. Speaking to Christians that are slaves. Let me rephrase that. Speaking to people that were slaves that had become Christians. That's the way it worked. They were already slaves and they had become Christians. He's going to speak to them. It's so interesting that the early Christian movement got started. A majority of it was among slaves. Now, this was not slaves by race, okay? This, you know, um, America's got our own history that we got to work through, and, 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 you know, this is not the moment we're going to spend a whole lot of time there, but a little bit. Um, but slavery was the way of the world. In fact, do you know um, it's really a miracle that when I say that word, we sort of get our, like, hackles up, and we're like, I can't believe that's in there. Did you know the vast majority of people around the world for the history of humanity shrugged their shoulders at slavery and assumed it was the best way to do business? We are the exceptions. Anybody want to guess why? Jesus people. Now, imperfect Jesus people that have done it wrong and have excused things, they should not have excused. But the reason, even if you're not a Christian, that comes on your radar as something that's awful and terrible is because you live 2,000 years into the Jesus movement that has affected the world in ways that are hard to even begin to imagine. And it's because of the Jesus movement. Okay, but he's talking to people that are in bad situations. Now, slavery, there were no small businesses 2,000 years ago, for the most part. There was no Sunoco 2,000 years ago. Um, what there was is there were wealthy people and slaves, okay? There was nobody filing, paying half your FICA, okay? Nobody, nobody putting in retirement for you. The, the way they did business was they, I mean, that was just, it was terrible. It was the way the world was before the Jesus movement took hold of it. In fact, the places where slavery 
was banished. There's no place where slavery was ran off the face of the earth that didn't have a Christian influence. That's how that happened, whether it was race-based or whether it was income-based, which is sort of how this worked. But he's speaking to people that are in bad situations. He says slaves. So you could think of slaves as first century employees that were locked into a contract they couldn't get out of if they didn't, if the, even if they wanted to. That may be, a, it's still slavery, it's still but just a, a way to, for us to wrap our heads around it because we need to apply this to us, right? Slaves that became Christians obey your earthly masters in everything. Now here's how you know these are not in stone commandments for every situation. But they're, they're guidelines, they're really important guidelines. Okay, what if the, the master had told the slave, deny Jesus is Lord and say Caesar is Lord? What do you think Paul would have said to the slave that had become a Christian? He would have said, that's a hill worth dying on. And this is a situation where you should not obey your master. He's not saying it's okay to have a master. He's not saying it's okay, the situation is okay. And I, I really don't think he's saying always in every single situation do it. This is, this is, I mean, when you say things, do you always put every caveat and every parentheses in there and every exception in there? No, because you can never say anything, could you? It's like, you tell your kids, obey the teacher. How many parents have said, you need listen to the teacher? How many parents? Raise your hand, parents. Listen, do what the teacher says. Raise your hand, nobody? Okay, that was me. Okay, that's just me. All right, so, but when I say that, do I need to say, oh, listen, kids, I want you to do what the teacher says, um, unless they tell you to cheat, or unless they tell you to steal, or murder somebody, or um, take the American flag and burn it, or what, you know, what, and then I go walk away. Then I say, also, also, don't, uh, you can do what the teacher says, unless, and how long would that conversation take for me to go through every little caveat, every little, it's ridiculous. you can't do that, right? When you're giving instructions to people, you, you got to give the gist of it, you know, the basic idea. So he says, slaves, obey your masters in everything. Employees, do, do good work, maybe, is the way to think of it for us. You know, be a good employee even when you don't have the best employer. It doesn't mean you need to stay there. You may need to leave, but while you are there, if you're a Jesus person, you show how different you are by actually wanting to do the best even when you have a bad boss. Okay. And do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence. It applies teenagers to teachers when they're jerks. I'm a teacher, so I can say this. Sometimes teachers are jerks. You know, sometimes teachers enjoy bullying their students. Because if you're little, they're bigger than you, or if you're big like them, they've got referrals, and maybe there's nobody else in life that does what they say. Now, there's a lot of great teachers, you know, but I'm just saying, if this is you, you can apply this to your math class <laughs> where the teacher's not so great. Okay. Do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for the human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is in the Lord Christ you are serving. I finished with two minutes to go, which was supposed to be like halfway through. Okay, here's the, here's the thought. Most of us, at times in our lives, when we thought about the third of our life we spend at work or school, we would say, we don't say it, but we'd think it, I work for a boss to get a paycheck. I work for a boss to get a a paycheck. A follower of Jesus, what Paul is saying here is that should never be our mindset. Now, I'm not saying getting paid is not important. It is important, but it's actually a side benefit of something that is way more important. And if, our, if you borrow the culture's mindset about labor, which is you work for a boss to get a paycheck, let me tell you what's going to happen with the boss. Either you become a sycophant who sucks up to the boss, nobody likes to be that guy, and when you are that guy, you usually don't even know you are that guy, unless somebody tells you, so anyway, it could be you, okay? Or if you don't become that guy, you'll become resentful because you work for a boss, and a boss can't deliver purpose and meaning in your life, and so you become resentful, and you'll become the complaining person that too many Christians are that nobody wants to be with. So working for a boss is a bad idea. It never works out. I'm not saying you don't respect your boss. I'm saying for. The word for has to deal with purpose, doesn't it? The purpose, for. And if you work for a paycheck, it's just, that means it's just a transitory, it's just tra like you're just, tra it's transactional. It's transactional. 
It's, you know, I get, you know, and you, that's not, that is not the way Christians are meant to work. Instead of working for a boss, for a paycheck, here's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to look at our work, whether it's a great situation or a bad situation, and say we work for God to do good. We work for God to do good. And what a difference it would make in our lives if we did that. I mean, I know some of y'all are like, well, I work for God. I make Pringles cans at Sunoco. Well, check this out. Um, so Pringles cans are not very godly or not very important. I want you to think about something for a second. You make Pringles cans and you think, how can I be working for God if I do that? What would happen if everybody who makes Pringles cans quit tomorrow? No more Pringles, but you know what else? Did you, did you know that the trickle-down effect is that people who make containers, you don't realize this, but you're making food cheaper and easier to transport, and we take it for granted, and that people would die before too long if we quit making containers for food that were cheap and easily accessible and simple to ship? I mean, you do something that at least the goal of it, and I know the chips aren't good for you, but at least the goal of it is something that enriches humanity. So why don't you make Pringles cans as if you're working for God who actually is interested in making the human race healthier and better and more vibrant and more full of life so that everybody can have the food that they need. I mean, we were on our way to that before COVID and we took a, a step back. Do you realize how much poverty around the world decreased? It's almost unimaginable. And maybe we can start back again and decrease those numbers. And if we ever are in a world where there are no more people that can't afford to eat, do you know why we're going to get there? It's because people work in paper product factories that make cheap containers so that people can eat and survive. So don't tell me you're not working for God. Don't tell me you couldn't work for God if you changed your mindset. And so we can do all things, whether it's teach or whether it's law enforcement or whether it's um, maybe we, we help the people that help others or maybe it's finances or whatever. We can do all things with a change in mindset that we are not working for a boss for a paycheck because no matter how much you make, it is not enough to secure your future. But we're working for God to do good and then wouldn't it be amazing if people knew that there were Christians in their workplace not because you invited them to church go for it I think it's good and not because you wear a Christian t-shirt but what if they knew there were Christians at your workplace because you work differently and people stood up and took notice and they would say things like he she even does the right thing when no one's looking they must be a Christian now, we hadn't done that in our culture, so it's going to take some time. So i got three things, and we're done, okay? but three things we can do is, you know, that, that when we work, we should be good at the work that we do. We should do the best work we do, followers of Jesus. We should be known for being good at work. I mean, let's just take, for example, nobody does this. Let's just say you're a wood carver, and that's your job. Why don't you carve wood as if God's going to hang that birdhouse in heaven? Well, that's the way to do it, you know? And I know nobody does that perfectly, because we get tired, and—, and it's like we're standing between the way things were and the way things will be one day. And we're straddling on that line. But follower of Jesus, it's like we're called to put more weight on this foot. And, and tr at least try, at least try to submit a third of our life at work under the umbrella of our faith so that it can be rich. Guys, we should be not only do good work, we should be good for the people that we work with. No more petty jealousies because you think to climb the corporate ladder, you've got to throw somebody else down it. We should be the follower of Jesus. Check this out. You want people to know that something's different about you. Train the person that might take your, your place. Train them like you want the best for them. You know, it's not about you because you would say, I have faith. That in my life, when I submit any area of my life to Jesus, marriage, finances, or work, or anything else, it always works out for the best. So I'm not only going to try to do good work as if whatever I make is going to be hung in heaven, I'm going to try to be good for the people around me because that's what Jesus would do. So that's what I'm going to do. It's part of my holy calling and to be good ethically. Uh, we should be the people that always at least try to do the right thing. And then last service I was saying, we should tell the truth, and I thought about it, and I've said this before. Uh, telling the truth is complicated because sometimes we don't know what the truth is. But how about this? You always know when you lie, don't you? How about never lie, follower of Jesus, ever, ever, ever? 
because we're, something's different about us ethically and the work that we do and the way that we care for people. And so I didn't get through, I did get through, but I did it super fast. So what's the takeaway? How about show up on time tomorrow at work and help the people around you even if it doesn't appear to help yourself and make something, whether it's a spreadsheet or a can or a nicely mown lawn as if it's going to be in heaven because you may be surprised what gets carried over. And if we lived out that, can you imagine how attractive, can you imagine how attractive the Jesus way would be to our world? Because who doesn't want to work with people like that? I'm going to ask you to stand as we close. Father, may our light shine among men as we mow lawns. May our light shine among men as we plan for the future. May our light shine among men as we teach children who are sometimes hard to teach. May our light shine among men as we work with coworkers who maybe don't, haven't earned our help, but we give it anyway. May our light shine among men and women as we make things believing that they ought to be worthy of the kingdom of heaven because we're people that have been bought at a pro such a high price to belong to the kingdom of heaven. God, will you help us to allow our faith in Jesus to flood three-thirds of our life, not two-thirds of it, and that means work belongs to you. And now we no longer have to work for a boss to get a paycheck, but we get to go to work every day for you, even if it's unfair and it's similar to what these people were going through 2,000 years ago. We can still work for you even if we work for a tyrant at our job. And we can still work for good even though a paycheck is important and we'll trust you to make the rest of it work out. Help us to be those people for the sake of your reputation in our community. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, I went over. Next week, we'll be back again for some more How to Be an Awesome Human. Y'all have a great week.